this seminar about birth, death and the unborn is going to be a discussion of the Buddhist philosophy of change. And I'm going to start out by going into the very tricky and difficult question of the Buddhist view of birth and death and the doctrine which is ordinarily understood as reincarnation or rebirth. It's a curious thing that many Westerners who become interested in Hinduism or Buddhism do so because of this idea of reincarnation. They like it. It gives a more satisfactory vision of individual history and development than the two possibilities that would normally be open to Westerners to believe in. On the one hand, you've got the choice of the Christian view, which is that you live in this world once, and in this fourscore years and ten, your eternal fate is settled. Or you've got the possibility of the materialistic view, which is that you only live once, and when you're dead, you're dead. That's that. You're a flash of consciousness between two eternal darknesses. Intelligent people in the Western world have never felt very happy about either of these two prospects. And therefore there's a certain attractiveness about the idea, which seems to be the point of Buddhism and Hinduism, that you are a soul on a pilgrimage. And that from some extremely obscure origin you began, uh, as some sort of animalcule, and worked your way up step by step through all sorts of forms of life, and finally, you have the privilege of appearing in human form. And once you've got there, you have an opportunity to develop to the highest spiritual position. You must remember that according to both Hindu and Buddhist doctrines, the human form is a very privileged position. For there are, according to both of them, because they share a common cosmology, six domains of beings. And uh, if you visualize the wheel of life with its six divisions, at the highest top division, there is the realm of the deva. Deva is a word from which we get the word divine and equally the word devil. A deva means though originally a god or more correctly an angel. Angel is a better western translation of deva than god. Immediately opposite the deva world at the bottom of the circle there is the naraka world of beings in torment. This is the dimension of the world which is the screaming mimes, which is experience in the form of absolute horror. The deva world is the experience of being in the form of bliss. And between these two poles there are all kinds of ranges. There are, for example, the Ashuras next to the Devas going clockwise around the wheel. And the Ashuras, they are a wrathful beings. Ashura is the incarnation of divine anger. Then next to the Ashura going around are the animals all animals whatsoever. Then again we get to the Naraka at the bottom, the, the place of the purgatory, we'll call it. Then coming up again, there's the world of the Preta, who are frustrated beings. And they're represented iconographically as having very large bellies and very tiny mouths. That is to say, an immense appetite with very little means of satisfying it. They're a sort of spiritual bottleneck and then coming up between the Pretas and the Devas is the world of the humans. And this is understood to represent a sort of middle position. You can be liberated from the human state because the Devas are too happy to be liberated. The Ashuras too furious. The animals too dumb. The Narakas too tormented. And the Pretas too frustrated. You need not take this as a literal 
account of various kinds of being in the universe. You can take them simply as a depiction of various states of the human mind, of the moods you can go through. They're all really in your own head, as we shall see uh, later on about many other things. But these are the six worlds of Hindu and Buddhist cosmology. And the notion is that one reincarnates again and again through the six worlds. This is the popular idea. In other words, if you live this human life in a bad way and you become angry, if you devote your life to fury, you'll be reincarnated as an Asura. If you devote your life to merely living for back and belly, you'll be reincarnated as an animal. If you are horribly cruel to people, you'll be reincarnated as a Naraka, and so on all around. But on the other hand, if you do good things, in the course of your karma, you will be reincarnated in the Deva world, or in better and better situations in the human world. That's the popular understanding. And Westerners, many of them think, well, that's great, because this opens up vast vistas of future development. We can go on in future lives, working out our destinies, and we can also love to think about who we were before. Um, when you fall in love with somebody, did you meet before in some past life? Is this the working out of a karma that is between you? And it's very interesting. But the funny thing is that Hindus and Buddhists, who do believe in rebirth, do so not because they like it, but because they feel they have to accept it as a hard fact. And the whole task of the work of a sadhana or a spiritual practice and discipline is to get out of it. So it always strikes me it's very funny that Westerners take this up because they find it comforting. But Easterners uh, are always trying to get away from being reborn. It was so funny once, Joseph Campbell told me a story that he was sitting with a Vedanta Swami, one of these Vedanta Society Swami. And the Swami was saying, oh dear me, he said, you know, really the idea of rebirth is so wonderful. He said, I, I really, I, I think this is the, the, most, um, the most comforting notion. And Joe said to him, Swami, don't be a damn fool. What are you talking about? The idea of rebirth being so comforting. Don't you realize that that's what you're supposed to get away from? And the Swami suddenly jumped. He said, oh yes, of course. <laughs> it was like I once had a talk with a Swami and um, he was arguing, you see, that behind all the multiple forms of this world, there was only a one single divine principle and he was going on about this I said Swami you can't talk like that you know very well that the Brahman the ultimate reality isn't one because one has an opposite which is many and Brahman has no opposite you should speak as Brahman as the non-dual and again he said you talk just like a Hindu <laughs> they're funny you see because these Swamis have accepted an enormous amount of Western feeling. Uh, the British were responsible for that, for occupying India so long and perverting its traditions. <laughs> now, it is so curious, all this, because in Buddhism, there still prevails an idea of rebirth, very strong among all Buddhist countries. And yet, Buddhism explicitly denies that there is any individual reincarnating soul. You see, in Buddhism there is a doctrine which is called the three signs of being. I should more correctly say the Sanskrit word is bhava, B-H-A-V-A, and that means becoming rather than being. Bhava is from the, the basic root, I think, B-H, which is connected with, the, with growth. So bhava, Becoming, the process of change, has three signs. One is called Dukkha. D-U-H-K-H-A. Dukkha. In Sanskrit means frustration. 
is sometimes translated suffering. But I think frustration is a more general word, which is perhaps better. It's dukkha is the opposite of sukha. Sukha means sweet. Dukkha perhaps means sour. But in this, in the way it's used, it means frustration as a basic characteristic of living beings. Because for some reason or other, life is always eventually frustrating. You desire more than you can ever get. You overreach the possibilities. And so to every being, death comes as a collapse and as something unfortunate. The next sign of being is called anitya, A-N-I-T-Y-A in Sanskrit, anitya, which means impermanence. The opposite word being nitya, eternal. So anitya is, everything is in flux. And finally, anatman, A-N-A-T-M-A-N, anatman, which means that nothing has its own soul. Now that sounds to a Christian a terrible idea because we use the word soulless or we say to a person, you have no soul, which means you have no finer feelings. You have no, you're not a human being because Christian theology did distinguish between humans and animals by saying that animals have no soul. Idiots have no soul. They've lost their soul. But you can see at once that there is a complete difference of the meaning. This is a, to translate Atman as soul is ridiculous. Anatman means, basically, that nothing exists. Well, there's another word in Sanskrit, you have to know, Svabhava, S-V-A, that means oneself or one's own, same as the Latin suus, because the V becomes the U. Sva, bhava, bhava, becoming again, your own becoming. Or sometimes it's called your own nature or self-nature. So what it is saying is that you don't, that nothing has any real svabhava, because no individual thing of any kind exists except in relation to all the other things. In other words, you are what you are only because of your relationships to everything else. And therefore the whole universe is a system of interdependence. It's just as if, for example, you were to stand two sticks on the ground and lean them against each other and they will stand up and form an inverted V because they lean on each other. And uh, this is an old thing that they teach children in Japan, that these sticks leaning against each other form the Chinese character for man. And they say, therefore, man cannot exist unless we support each other. This is the basis, therefore, of brotherhood and of good social relationships. But underneath that is a far more profound idea that the universe coheres by everything depending on everything else. And therefore nothing exists alone. Nothing exists in its own right. And that's what Anatman means. You do not have an indestructible, immortal soul which is just plain you forever and ever and ever and is independent of there being anything else at all. Also, though, this does go along with the idea that there is not some kind of gaseous spook, some kind of etheric double, astral body, what have you, which outlasts the existence of the physical body and migrates to the next incarnation. So it has always been a puzzle for Buddhist philosophers to explain how they can at once believe in reincarnation and at the same time deny the existence of an individual spook which is independent of the physical frame.
and the most subtle discussions in all Buddhist literature range around this puzzle. The most important text of early Buddhism is a book called The Questions of King Melinda. This is the Greek Menanda. He is a king in the succession of Alexander the Great, who ruled in Alexander's Eastern Empire and had long conversations with a Buddhist sage by the name of Nagasena. And Nagasena tries to explain to the king how there can be rebirth without anyone who is being reborn. And so this is the problem to which we address ourselves. How can there be a continuing process without uh, anything carried along by it? And you will recognize at once that the problem is very largely semantic. Because it involves our whole idea of continuity. What, for example, do you mean by a wave? When you see, you throw a stone into the water, and from the plop point where the stone goes in, a whole lot of rings emerge, and they are waves, and they go out. And you can, as it were, look at one of them and follow it. And you say, I am watching a wave. But what is a wave? You know very well that the water itself, no, no volume of water, no specific volume of water is moving outwards from the place where you drop the pebble. It, the water is staying quite still so far as lateral motion is concerned. But the water is moving up and down. And these up and down movements create the illusion of a thing called a wave that goes along. Similar to the illusion when you watch a barber's pole revolving, it seems to be a procession of something that keeps going up from the bottom of the pole to the top. But actually it's just going around. Now that, that appearance of something moving when there is actually the only thing that is going outwards is motion. And motion is about as abstract as you can think. This is the whole root of the Indian idea of Maya, of the world as Maya, as a construct, as something which, shall we say, exists only in your mind. Only we shall have to be very careful uh, what we mean by that. And I'm going to come to that later on in the sermon. So here, here, is, here is the point. You are delivered from rebirth, this being the purpose of the spiritual disciplines of Hinduism and Buddhism. As soon as you are relieved of the illusion that something is going on, continuity, this after this after this after this, all linking up together into a chain. In the uh, famous Zen text called the Platform Sutra, attributed to Huenang, the Sixth Patriarch, there is a passage which says, if we allow our thoughts, past, present and future, to link up into a series, we put ourselves under restraint. But on the other hand, if we just see that they are not a, they, they, there is just this thought, and then this thought, and then this thought, uh, you are liberated. This is an idea which is taken up by T.S. Eliot in his poem, The Four Quartets, where he, you come to the passage where he says that you are getting on a train and you settle down in the compartment with your newspaper and you're going on a journey but the one who arrives at the destination will not be the same person who left the platform in the beginning because uh, you who sit here now are not the same as the people who came in at the door a little while ago just in exactly the same way as the flame of a candle appears to be a constant flame which we can identify as a thing but as a matter of fact it is a stream of hot 
energy, which is whatever particles, whatever gaseous molecules are here, are going like this the whole time, flowing upwards and disappearing. The, confl- the flame is converting the candle wax into gas. And in exactly the same way as we can see that the flame has an identity. We say it is a flame. We have a noun for it. Where actually it is a process. It is flaming. And so in, this, in just precisely that way, every human being is a process. Just as the flame is the conversion of wax into gas. So you and I are the conversion of air and water and light and beefsteak and milk into shit. And which again converts into something else, you see. We are the flowing vibration through which all this goes. And not for one moment are we the same. So then, the meaning of the Buddhist doctrine is that You, who live today, are never going to die. Because the one that's going to die will not be the you that's here now. And likewise, the one that's here now was never born. It goes like this. Uh, It is explained by Dogen, who was the most fabulous Zen philosopher living around 1200 AD, when he said, The spring does not become the summer, and the summer does not become the autumn. No one would say that spring becomes the summer. There is spring, and then there is summer. And he said in the same way, when you burn wood, there are ashes, but the wood does not become the ashes. There is wood, and then there is ashes. Each is, as it were, sufficient to itself. There are, as it were, so steps. It's like vibrations, uh, wave crests, you see, where the water doesn't move, you see. Water doesn't move laterally. So in this sense, by analogy, the spring does not become the summer. But by watching it, you in your mind impose motion on the up and down of the water. And so you say, the spring becomes the summer. So likewise, you say, the baby becomes the adolescent, becomes the uh, man, becomes the crone, becomes the corpse. And the Buddhists say no. These states follow in the same way as the apparent motion of a wave. And so, the, the, the a word to the wise is, live the moment you're in. There is no other place to be. You will not die, and you were never born. If you realize, if you see through the illusion, now this may sound as if one were creating a theory of the universe which is what you might call atomistic, discontinuous. It is saying the universe is nothing but point instants. And it all comes down to that, see? This is an extension of the Western philosophy of nominalism. Nominalism is opposed to realism. The nominalists argue against the realists' point of view, which is realists say there is such a thing as mankind. Mankind is a a reality, and every individual human is a special instance of a real universal substance called man. The nominalists argue this is abstraction and nonsense. There is no such thing as mankind. There are only individual people. And, of course, this has become, in the 20th century, the ascendant point of view. There is not really such a thing as the United States of America. That is a political abstraction. There are just the people who live here. 
But if you take nominalism to its logical conclusion, you get to the point where you don't exist at all. A human being? Well, there is no such thing as a human being. It's an abstraction. All there is is the molecules that are the cells uh, which infest your bones.